Hi there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to yet another cracking installment of the Matt Brown Show. Today, I am joined by Matt Myers, the CEO of Goal Solutions. This is the Built in California series, proudly brought to you by the Matt Brown Show. Maddie, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. No, the privilege is all mine, man. You guys are doing some incredible things, so I'm super excited to uh, have you here on the show and kind of get your your story out into the world. So, um, so uh, for those of our viewers and listeners around the world, Matt, that haven't heard of Goal Solutions, what's the elevator pitch here for for what you guys do? Sure. So we're a financial services business focused on the consumer lending space. So companies that make loans to consumers for a variety of purposes, whether it's education, so the student loan world, you hear all those great things about in the press, um, residential solar, home improvement, elective medical, personal loans. And we provide a variety of services to investors, originators, fintech providers in that space. We do billing payment processing for customers. So if you have a loan for residential solar system and you get bills, if you go online and make payments, uh, that's probably us who you're doing billing and payment processing through. Um, we do a lot of data visualization, a lot of machine learning, and artificial intelligence, custom scoring models, and a lot of reporting inside the investor community. So you know, I always like to tell people we're an enabler for others. Um, we do a lot of the stuff that, you know, maybe isn't always super sexy, but it's essential to optimize the value of businesses. And, you know, for a lot of fintech startups and a lot of investors, um, they have more important places they can spend their time and money. Um, but there are a lot of essential blocking and tackling services that we leverage technology, data, and really, really good people to bring to the market. Fantastic. So what uh, keeps you up at night these days? Um, other than my 38 week pregnant wife, um, which definitely keeps me up at night. Um, you know, uh, I, you know, I would say the biggest thing is really staffing. Honestly, uh, I mean, we've been growing at a 30% or so rate relatively quickly. Um, this, this year, we'll probably grow at 50% or so. Um, we're adding about 10 to 15 people per month. And, you know, while that's not adding 100 or 150 people um, in the markets that we operate in. So, you know, I'm in Southern California in San Diego. Um, we have a call center in Sioux Falls, San Diego. Both of those are highly competitive labor markets with unemployment rates hovering 1% to 2%. Um, and these days, especially post-COVID. Um, labor markets have just become uh, much more diversified. So you can, you know, take a job in San Diego and be working in New York or Chicago or anywhere. And so it's just made it much more competitive. Um, being in financial services in Southern California, it's not a financial services hotbed. Um, New York, Chicago, DC, you know, even Minneapolis, those are places that typically have a lot of labor for what we do. You know, San Diego is not the most competitive labor market. So, you know, when you're growing a business at the clip we're growing at, um, you know, that that's always something that keeps me up at night. Um, one thing that I would say doesn't keep me up at night, but is also very interesting is just what's going on with the American consumer right now. Um, the American consumer has had pretty good for the last 10 years or so. Um, you know, reasonably low inflation, very strong wage growth, um, a whole bunch of government stimulus during COVID. Um, now, if you look at the state of affairs, I mean, you've got you know pressure in the labor markets, you've got inflation that's been running rampant. Um, you've got a lot of pressure on the consumers. I mean, right now, credit card debt is at the all-time high it's been at. Uh, all of the savings, for, if you followed what was going on with American consumers during COVID, nobody could leave their house. So everybody saved all this money. They blown through all those savings. Now they're racking up credit card debt again. And, you know, my concern is always if consumers get over leveraged, they stop paying their bills, they start, you know, going into delinquency, defaulting. And that has a real adverse impact on the lenders. And those lenders are our clients at the end of the day. Um, you're touching on some very important uh, stuff, uh, Maddie, from my perspective in the sense of, you know, markets are always moving. And I think sometimes uh, as a community of business leaders, CEOs, et cetera, we, we're trying to compete uh, with these macroeconomic forces, COVID. Like we didn't expect that to happen, did we? Uh, we didn't expect a hyperinflation. Maybe we did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we didn't expect, uh, you know, a hyperinflation to not be as negative as what we, you know, imagined it right, would yeah, be. Yeah. And you're sitting in this uh, interesting position where you guys are growing. I mean, you're not growing incrementally. You're, you're growing 30 to 50 percent year in year. You're now, uh, you know, 170 plus people. You're adding, you know, more people every single month. Um, and so what what I'm sensing is that you as the CEO and your team um, have done a really great job at future pacing these uh, the timing of these markets. In other words, uh, my question to you, Matt, is how do you prevent becoming a slave 
to macroeconomic forces um, like the ones uh, we've touched on uh, up front? So honestly, I'll tell you, we're all slaves to macroeconomic forces, that there is no getting out of being a slave. Um, but I think if you take as a given, the macroeconomic environment is going to change. It's really all about, like, I, I'm a statistical modeler by training, big on decision trees and neural models. And if you think about the world as one big decision tree, if the economy goes well, this happens. If the economy goes poorly, that happens, right? So if you look at the way we positioned our business, it's not to... It's not that the macroeconomic environment doesn't impact us. It's that we know, depending on what's going on, how we're going to pivot our business. So, for example, um, when the economy is very strong and interest rates are very low, um, generally speaking, the market participants that uh, work in our space are going to be banks, credit unions, insurance companies, um, companies that lend money and thrive in a low interest rate environment where there is low volatility. That's the one, the one nice thing about the consumer lending space. People always need to borrow money does not matter if the economy is good or the economy is bad. Uh, in the United States of America, consumers are, I don't want to say addicted to borrowing money, um, but I will say that, you know, they need to borrow money for things like solar, uh, like school, like home improvement projects. And so for us, it's really about understanding the economy is good. It's going to be the banks, the credit unions. They're going to be the ones lending the money. So make sure that you have good connectivity into those communities. When the world goes sideways, like the world has gone a little sideways in the consumer credit markets these days, it's not going to be necessarily the banks and the credit unions. It's going to be the alternative lenders. It's going to be hedge funds. It's going to be distressed credit funds. It's going to be a different universe of people. People. So for us, it's maintaining connectivity into all of those communities. I and mean, I can tell you for the last seven or eight years, you would not find many hedge funds, private equity companies, or anybody like that around the consumer lending space. They just can't compete. Um, today, given all of the disruption, it's a much more active community in the consumer lending space. So what we have done is we just pivot all of our business development and our marketing efforts. We maintain relationship with all of the constituencies, but from a messaging perspective, we know when you turn the corner from a macroeconomic perspective, it's a whole different audience who you're talking to relative to who you've been talking to the last eight or 10 years. So being able to pivot that message to the people who you know are participating today, it's, it allows us to at least de-risk the impact of the changing macroeconomic environment by sort of moving towards where the forces are going to take you as opposed to trying to fight those forces. Yeah, you're touching on something that's really, really important, I think, because it's very, my experience has been in talk, because I speak to CEOs every week, is that it's sometimes you, 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 you're trying to not um, get pigeonholed into a particular segment. And so if you think, ah, oh, well, you know, good market, low inflation, as you touched on, great for lending. So that's your segment. But now, like you touched on, the markets are now moving. It's like there's hyperinflation. Consumers are lending less. So like you, if you keep banging the we lend, <laughs> we lend capital drum, like you're missing the, the where the market's actually going. And to your point, right. there's this positioning job, this messaging job, or by extension, the point there's a new point of view that actually needs to be put in market so that you can remain relevant uh, and, to your point, pivot uh, into these new opportunities. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. no, exactly. I mean, I think it's, it's as much about understanding what's going on in the markets and just being able to pivot and address. Because like people are still... To your point, there's hyperinflation. People are borrowing money out of necessity. There's a riskier profile associated with that customer. If you look at what's going on right now in the subprime community, subprime loan performance is atrocious. I mean, subprime auto is terrible. Subprime credit card is terrible. Subprime mortgage is terrible. So people are borrowing money not because it's a healthy part of an overall consumer balance sheet. People are borrowing money because they blow all their savings and they have nowhere else to go. And in, in that environment, that's an environment that banks, credit unions, insurance companies are less comfortable operating into, which is where the pendulum swings over to more distressed credit investors who are willing to make riskier loans. They're also going to earn higher returns for that, but that's a very different constituency. And from a service provider perspective, they demand very different things than a bank or a credit union who generally like to operate in a low risk, low volatility world, because that's just not the world we're living in. No, it's not. So what have you guys learned? Because obviously you've, you've been successful at pivoting. I mean, obviously I know that you started in residential solar uh, for a long period of time. Um, and now you've kind of pivoted into these different, shall we say, streams, if you like, based on what you know uh, the community is being uh, subjected to, not only from a macroeconomic perspective, but also from, um, you know, from a 
from a segmentation and lending and, and, and so on and so forth. So um, how do you pivot? Like you guys have gone into all these different service lines now. How did you decide which service lines to go into? And what have you? what is your advice for, uh, for other CEOs who are thinking about, well, hey, markets are moving. I need to go to a different place. I'm kind of like, I need some guidance. Yeah, so we actually started as a student loan company. So we started as a student loan company, um, probably uh, technically we started about 20 years ago. Practically, we started about, I'd say like 15, 16 years ago. Um, and we started as a pure student loan company. And uh, all we did was provide services to people who made education loans. And if you're familiar with the education loan market, it is, um, we see like lots of headlines about how big the student loan market is, most of that work is done by the federal government. So the federal government in America loans out about 90% of all of the education loans in this country. So while the education finance market is very large, it's basically a monopoly run by the federal government. So it's hard to, from a services perspective, make a lot of money doing that. Um, so it's small. It's also, from a regulatory perspective, it's very, very high profile. So, you I mean, you cannot pick up a newspaper or turn on the TV without, you know, some pundit talking about how terrible student loan debt is in the country, how lenders are evil, et cetera, et cetera. That's like a longer conversation for a different day, whether those people are right or wrong. Um, but from our perspective, it just creates regulatory uncertainty and regulatory risk. And so we look at the education finance market, you know, I've really looked at it six or seven years ago and said, it's small. And from a private student loan perspective, and it's very, very dicey from a regulatory and PR perspective. And we thought that does not seem like a good industry for us to hitch our wagon to in the future. So we looked at, well, what are we really good at? And what we were really good at was managing very long duration assets. Student loans are 20, 25 year loans. Um, and they have very quirky amortization characteristics. They don't cash flow for a long time. They do this thing called re-amortizing or recasting multiple times. And we thought, you know, okay, so we're good at managing Managing complicated long duration consumer assets, um, where can we take that skill set and apply it in a place that we think is a better growth accelerant for the organization down the road? Uh, and at that time, residential solar was just starting to emerge. Um, the cost of solar panels was coming down relatively quickly. Uh, the federal government, through this thing is called the investment tax credit, was really encouraging, especially here in California, uh, really encouraging investment into renewable energies. Residential solar was a big part of that. Uh, uh, and those are uh, likewise uh, residential solar loans are long duration 20 25 years uh, and they also have some sort of quirky amortization characteristics they have this weird thing that i won't bore you with called an investment tax credit based for amortization and we looked at that and we said, this is an asset class that largely looks very similar to what we're doing in student loans, but it doesn't have any of the regulatory headwinds that we're dealing with there. And it's a much larger and growing market. So we pivoted to that industry probably in, in earnest about six or seven years ago. And if you were to look at our company's revenue profile, six years ago, we were 95 to 98% student loans. You know, As we sit here today, we're at 50% you know, student loans, and that's falling on a regular basis. Uh, and it's really been replaced by residential solar and then some adjacent asset classes like home improvement. And then more recently, we've gotten to elective medical as well. And if you look at the macroeconomic forces for residential solar, the Inflation Reduction Act that was recently placed has a lot of large stimulants for American consumers to continue to invest in residential solar as a way to sort of de-risk people's reliance on, a, especially in California, a relatively unpredictable energy grid. And so we were fortunate that the asset class that we bet on on, just happened to be one that was growing exponentially. And, and we knew kind of based on macroeconomic forces, that seems like where things were trending. And it's just been a great boon for our business. I mean, it has been, you know, from a regulatory perspective, it's something that is very positive. Um, from a growth perspective, it's something that's very strong. So, you know, for us, I mean, if you had asked me 10, 15 years ago, I didn't even know what residential solar was. So, so this was something that to me was a very foreign concept. But as we were analyzing the market and where we could pivot our business to, it seemed like a very very logical place to move. And the fruits for the business have just been fantastic. I mean, even though our student loan business has continued to grow, our, our residential solar and home improvement has grown so quickly, it's really dwarfing our student loan services business. Yeah, it's interesting that because it's, the, I suppose, the another way to articulate what you said, Matt, is, is that all boats rise with the rising tide. So if you're able to identify which tides yep. are in fact rising, like residential, so like it wasn't a thing as part of your strategy, but you looked at it, you said, well, you know, where are the headwinds not as, as you know, acute? And so, oh, look, there's this sector. Let's go after that. 
Yeah, you're exactly right. So I think what we, for, for me, it was as much taking a look at our business and historically things like our mission statement, our vision statement were pointed at the fact that we were a education finance services company. Uh, and as I kind of took a step back, I said, well, we're not really an education finance and services company. We're a consumer loan financial services company that just happens to have been focused in this one area of education finance. How do we take what we're good at and how do we look at the macroeconomic forces of the country and how do we identify um, why don't, what's not start with what we're doing today as a given. Let's start with what our skill set is today as a given and then find different places that we can apply that skill set and really focus on the areas where we think the macroeconomic trends are most positive for the organization. And so that's the same discipline that we're taking to the business today. I mean, um, we've been very successful in solar, home improvement, electric medical, but um, I know that the success of our business came not from, you know, kind of just doing the same thing we've been doing, but doing it better, but finding new applications of the things that we do really well. So leveraging proprietary technology, leveraging data visualization, leveraging a lot of AI and machine learning models. So where else can we apply those? So right now, um, while we're extraordinarily busy with the asset classes that we're in today, we're looking at a whole village of asset classes, credit card, mortgage, reverse mortgage, auto loans, and thinking, where do our skill set fit best? Because you don't want to wake up six or 12 months from now and be trying to figure out where you're going to go next then. Um, we need to have this decision made well in advance. And we do wake up and decide to pivot. All of the pre-work we've done that is a precondition for a successful expansion, we've already done all of that work. Sounds to me like you're sitting on some secret sauce there because <laughs> pivoting is hard, okay? Um, and when, you, when you're a growing company, like you guys are it's like pivoting and growing at the same time like we have enough problems as it is just trying to scale our operational structures get our messaging right for the stuff we do today right. <laughs> and then yeah you are you're like well automotive cure crowd like there we go well i mean but a lot of it is having discipline to focus resources on it right so i mean it, it, it i I will confess that it is definitely difficult when you're growing at a fast rate and you're adding new clients. I mean, we, we've added 70 clients this year. Um, if you were to go back in 2019, 2020, we were averaging 13 client, new clients a year. We've averaged uh, about 50 new clients a year, you know, for the last three years, 2020, 2020, and this year. And we've added 70 already this year. So, you know, when you're adding new clients at the rate we're adding, Growing at the rate we're growing, um, so whether you're scaling technology, scaling people, it definitely requires the focus of a large part of the organization. But what we've done internally is we have created dedicated silos of people whose whole job in life is to focus on the future. Um, so while you might have 80% of the organization focused on really you know, scaling, growing, you know, enabling the core business today, we have 20% of the people. They work, we have a dedicated innovation group, we have a dedicated innovation lab, and there are people whose whole job in life is to basically ignore what we are doing today, other than uh, understanding what we are doing well and focus on finding new applications for what it is that we're doing well today. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to be able to capitalize on those new opportunities. I mean, I, I think, you know, auto loans is a place that we could make a real difference in that industry. Um, we are just candidly too busy right this second to make a pivot and make a move into auto. But I don't think by, I don't think we'll be in that same position by the middle of next year. I think we'll have done a, a better job of scaling our technology. We've moved basically our entire technology infrastructure off-prem into the cloud. Um, we've gotten much better at scaling automation. We've gotten much better at our hiring systems, skills screening for the people we're onboarding to make sure that you know we're not just hiring people, we're hiring good people so that retention rates are strong, attrition rates are lower. Um, as we get our systems buttoned up, we're going to want to pivot. And, and my point is more, you can't, if you decide I want to pivot today, if you're just starting the process of figuring out where you're going to pivot to, I mean, that's a long process. You can't just like snap your fingers and figure out where you're going to go. So we need dedicated people. We need to invest the time. We need to have dedicated innovation forums so that even if it's not actionable right this second, when it does become actionable, at least we've already invested the time and energy so that we can make that pivot go from concept to reality much more quickly. Yeah, there's lots to unpack there. I want to start with a resource application because I think what I've, what I've struggled with uh, as CEO of a scaling company um, is is literally resource application. So putting the right people in the right seats on the bus. Yep. So, uh, so sometimes you have like, you know, product marketing sitting with the engineering team. Yep. You know, it's like, yep. is that the right place to put them? Yep. Um, and then of course you've got new people joining and then you've, you're also diversifying. So it makes what you're doing as a, as a CEO 
um, and is a visionary super complex right. quite quickly. Right. Um, so what have you learned about effective resource application in a scaling environment such as the one that you have there at Gold Solutions? You know, so our CTO, uh, a guy named Murdad Rashi Faruqi, I mean, he's a great CTO. Um, he, he likes to carve our engineers' time and say, you know, hey, I want you to develop 70% of your time to Horizon 1, which is kind of everything you're working on today, you know, 20% to Horizon 2, which is, you know, six months, and then 10% to Horizon 3, which is, you know, kind of, you know, two years and beyond, right? Um, I think that works okay. I will tell you, practically speaking, it, it sounds a lot better than I think it works. And the reason I say that is because for your data engineer or your application developer or your accountant or your analyst or somebody like that, they're not great at um, parsing their mind into like, okay, I have 60% that I'm focusing on my current state, you know, 30%, you know, the next six months and then 10% they're not all that great at uh, allocating their time that way. And so I think it becomes harder. And, and, and where do you think they're gonna err on? They're gonna always err on the side of, I need to do what it takes to keep the train on the tracks today. I mean, in a growing business where there's always a fire drill going on somewhere inside the organization, they're always going to be pulled to those near-term solutions. So while I think encouraging all employees to spend some portion of their time focused on the longer term, I don't think practically you can rely on that as a real pure driver of innovation. So like we have a senior vice president of innovation inside the organization. His job is just to innovate. His job is not to necessarily worry about the fire drill. The building could be burning down and he is sitting outside the building trying to figure out where am I going to put the new building up? Um, I mean, that's an investment. I mean, that's an investment of dollars. That's an investment of time. We have an innovation sandbox. It's a parallel technology environment that functions just like our current technology environment, but it's a development sandbox to allow our developers to try new machine learning modules, to try new ways of architecting our proprietary technology systems. And so for me, at least, you know, I think we started on the, hey, let's all spend part of our time thinking about the future. And I just saw us all getting sucked back in the day to day so frequently. We just said, that can't work. I mean, we need to have dedicated people who are not trying to figure out how to allocate their time between the current state and the future state. Like we need people who live in the future state. So, you know, that took me a while to figure out. I mean, from a budgeting perspective, I mean, you know, when you're bringing on people making a quarter million dollars a year and their whole job is to focus on the future and you may not be able to take advantage of any of their ideas for pick a period of time, six, nine, 12 months, because you're so busy dealing with the current state. You know, from a budgeting perspective, I think those are difficult things for people to wrap their brain around. But, you know, for us, you know, our vision statement is to be the most innovative financial services company in the world. So if that's the vision statement we're going to live, if we don't put our money where our mouth is at the end of the day, I mean, we're just going to end up being somebody else who's swimming really hard to stay in one place. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot to get into. There's a, there's a, the, um, and I love what you're doing with this innovation lab. So I've, I, so there's this thing uh, like Clayton Christensen, I'm sure you've read his book, The Innovator's Dilemma. Yeah. And he was, you know, he's talking about like, I don't know whether you've heard the story about the skunk works. So it was like when they built the, the jet engine, it was during like the Second World War. So they basically took the engineers off like uh, Lockheed Martin's main like airport or sorry, airplane uh, manufacturing line and shoved them into a, a, a warehouse near a smelly factory <laughs> <laughs> so that the thinking, to your point about living in the future, so that their thinking wouldn't be killed by the corporate antibodies. Right. Right? So you have this lab, uh, and it's a great thing to say. It's like, well, we have this innovation lab, and look, we're going to be, you know, da, da, da. and this is the, it's lip service most of the time. And yeah. it's very refreshing to me to meet a, a, a CEO who's actually got this thing going, <laughs> yeah. you know, you know uh, because, and, and the other thing I wanted to maybe get into, and maybe you could connect this back to your data science uh, play, in that most innovations take the existing premise and make it slightly better yep. and then they try and commercialize that yep. what i'm hearing from you is that you're in the it's like you're not in the in the obvious solution space you're in the not you're in the application of data science and visualization as an example uh, to figure out non-obvious solutions to obvious problems Right. Yeah, no. So, I mean, I always, um, so, so we promote innovation widely to the organizations. We have a monthly innovation contest where uh, anybody can submit an idea and it has to be an innovation they've actually implemented. This is not like, you know, hey, I thought a flying car. 
customers, right? That, that's not the kind of innovation we're necessarily expecting customer service reps or data engineers to come up with. Um, these are small innovations in people's lives. And if they submit them, they get a $50 and we pick winners every month and they get $500. And, you know, I spend a lot of time talking about innovation and, you know, the example I always use for innovation is fire. Uh, I mean, if you were to look at, you know, kind of what is like widely heralded as the most impactful innovation in human history, it's fire, right? Uh, and if you look at how fire came to be, I mean, it was like, you know, rubbing sticks together, right? Um, if, if kind of fire had stopped at rubbing sticks together, the world would be a lot less efficient place, right? Uh, if you look at sort of the evolution of fire, it went from rubbing sticks together to matches, to Zippos, to disposable lighters, to, I always, and I talk, you know, today um, there is a solar windproof lighter. I mean, it needs no butane and it could be in the middle of a sandstorm and it would still work, right? Um, and, and, and how you got from rubbing sticks to solar powered windproof lighter is a whole bunch of small innovations in the middle, right? And so it's not that we're not looking for the next fire, but a lot of our business and a lot of the way that we innovate is not, you know, building, creating fire. It is making fire a little bit more accessible, a little bit more windproof, a little bit more. And so Whenever I analogize the kind of innovation we do, that's it, you know, whether it is putting more of the visualization capabilities in our clients' hands or creating more automation around the data we're doing or uh, inside our servicing business, finding ways to create more conversational IVRs so there's more customer self-service opportunities so that people don't have to wait in phone queues and talk to humans and deal with all of that. Um, those are the kind of innovations around the edges that they all add up to a lot at the end of the day. And so while we're always looking for, you know, especially on the data visualization side, bigger innovations, ways to change the way that we're visualizing, presenting information, the way that our clients can access it, the amount of flexibility they have, um, those are always things we're focused on, but it's just as much kind of some of the smaller things around the edges because all that stuff really adds up to a better customer experience. Absolutely. So a funny story for you. So, you know, um, you, uh, the, the, you guys put uh, a man on the moon uh, in 1969. So not, this is the thing with innovation, right? Which I think is a good story to share at this point. So everyone's like romanced about the new shiny stuff, but sometimes the most valuable things are right in front of us. Yep. Right, so it's like, look at all this data, and it's like, look at what, look what we know, and it's like, yeah, but okay, that's cool, I get it, it's shiny and it's sexy. Going back to the moon story, so uh, obviously we put a man on the moon in 1969. When do you think we put wheels on bags? You know, weedy bags. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I have no like, idea, dude. It was three years later. <laughs> really? <laughs> three years later, like. Explain that to me. Yeah. So this is <laughs> the thing. Funny. This is the innovate. This is the innovator's dilemma for me, yeah, yeah. in the sense of like we we want to innovate, right? We think innovate or die, like right. and, you know. And there's all these opportunities and things like this, and so we get all caught up in structures for innovation, people for innovation, data for innovation. But sometimes the most obvious things. The most valuable things are right in front of us. Here's a, so here's a story. So uh, we had our innovation contest. One of the winners one month was a processor in our Sioux Falls call center. So we do a lot of stuff on the processing side. We file these things called UCCs, which are uh, essentially liens on people solar. We process um, forbearance reports, exceptions, kind of all this stuff, right? And uh, she won because she went on uh, Amazon and realized that it was a keyboard that was configured slightly different than the standard keyboard. Uh, and the way the keys were positioned, it made it, uh, it was 10 or 15 seconds faster to process something they do 50, 60 times a day. And, and it ended up saving hundreds of man hours. And I mean, we're paying people on a fully loaded basis, you know, call it $30 an hour, right? So I mean, you're saying hundreds of hours of manpower time at 30 bucks an hour, basically because a person decided to go on Amazon and look at keyboards because she was like, it seems like I have to go across this keyboard a lot. That seems really difficult. If I could find that was configured just a little bit differently, I think it could save me some time. So, I mean, that, I mean, again, in the category of, I mean, literally right in front of her face was this keyboard she was looking at all day and spending five, 10 minutes going out to Amazon, replacing keyboards for the whole team generated hundreds and then ultimately thousands of hours of time savings. Yeah, it's a, but that's exactly it. And it's such a great, uh, I know, right? It's like, it's just an obvious thing. It had nothing to do with, by the way, 
artificial intelligence Correct, and machine right, learning. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, when the, and the person, so in the person who won the innovation contest the next month had um, built a new customer engagement for from scratch, leveraging neural network, machine learning, very sort of like complicated kind of like flying car or, or all stuff, right? Uh, but that to me shows kind of the bookends of innovation and that, you know, just because people think about innovations being so, you know, technology savvy and especially in our world you know lots of machine learning and artificial intelligence proprietary cloud hosted you know applications that we build um those aren't always the most impactful innovations to the organization at the end of the day yeah it's like it's like are you a good hire yes or no <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> like figure that stuff out. You know what I mean? Right. right. Uh, and so that's why, you know, internally we run innovation contests every month. You know, we encourage the managers to submit submissions that their employees are doing. We do uh, so at our all company meetings. We always recognize the people who are the winners. We recognize the people who submitted. I mean, we want to celebrate innovation at all levels of the organization because whether it's kind of like tightening the screws on what we're doing today or building for the future, I mean, it's really about establishing a culture culture that encourages and rewards innovation like you know so, uh, you know for our vision statement which is to be the most innovative financial services company in the world you know people always say to me you know oh math it's very audacious you know the world's a very big place you know uh, in financial services there's a lot and to be the most innovative you know and i tell people all the time you know like i mean i hear you but this is one of those you know shoot for the stars land the moon kind of things you know and for us it's about you know we're not you know our vision statement's not to be the most profitable it's not to be the fastest growth Growing. Um, to me, those are byproducts of establishing a good culture that focuses on innovation and delivers products that customers need. And if you do all of those things, to me, you know, revenue, growth, those are byproducts of running a good business that delivers things that people really need. And so I really think, you know, cul you know, fostering a culture that encourages and rewards innovation is the most important thing that we do. And it's our number one company value. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, that sticking with the moon thing. We should call this the moon show. <laughs> <laughs> but there was this, uh, there was, I think it was the president, like JFK was walking through like NASA and there was a dude sweeping the floor and he was like, you're like, what are you doing here? And he's like, well, I'm putting a man on the moon. Like I'm helping to put a man on the moon. It's like the same thing, right? So, um, and, you know, exactly going, back right. to, going back to your point around like, you know, the, the guy sweeping, it's an idea, like clean, making sure we have a clean uh, floor. I mean, you must think like the impact of not having that when you're right. building a rocket is kind of huge, right? Well, I mean, if you look at the most recent, I mean, NASA has been trying to shoot a rocket into space now for the last month. Right. And every time they try to do it, something goes wrong. You know, one of the tanks mm -hmm. isn't hooked up properly or there's a leak here. There's, I mean, it just goes to show all of the little things that go to enabling broader strategies. I mean, if you get any of those little things wrong, broader strategy is going to fall apart. Yeah. So, I mean, how do you as a team, how do you evaluate the strength of ideas or innovation or innovative ideas? Like what's your approach to measuring consistently, you know, a person sweeping the floor or a rocket scientist literally building the circuitry on a rocket ship? So I'll bifurcate it a little bit. So we have the dedicated innovation forum we have that really assesses the strategic innovation initiatives inside the organization. It's really comprised of people who I think have a good finger on the pulse of our organization and the broader market. So that's going to be folks from business development, folks from technology, folks from new product. Um, th those are the people who I would say are involved in the longer term innovation planning for the organization that um, some more are like the flying cars, like more of that kind of innovation. Uh, if you look at our monthly innovation contest where we recognize and award winners and we're usually getting 20, 30 submissions a month from the employees, um, those are voted on by the management team. So we have a management team of 15 people inside the organization representing all functional areas, whether it's you know legal and compliance, or the we have four individual PLs inside the business, the four individual PL owners, our CTO, our general counsel, all of the people who touch the business, and they vote. It's a, it's a very straightforward. Uh, so what happens is people submit the ideas, they submit what their idea was, their impact on the organization, you know, how it made their lives as well as the lives of their peers and coworkers easier and these written submissions come from my admin we get a whole stack of them every month and i disseminate them out to the management team and then they vote blind so this I, trying to mitigate the influence of people lobbying for ideas they think are best i send out the ideas we calibrate the votes internally and then we award the winners so it's a very democratic system i mean i'm a firm believer in that 
the people who understand what makes the organization tick, which are all of the 15 leaders who run the various areas of the organization, they really understand the impact of innovation. Like they're the ones who are going to feel the benefit. Like um, one of our IT guys uh, won last month for creating a streamlined onboarding process that is entirely automated. So when a person is hired, you need to do all of this stuff, right? You need to establish user IDs and credentials. They have to get access to share drive, all of the stuff that has to happen, right? Um, so he completed, he figured a completely integrated way inside Microsoft Teams to set up everything. So it's, I mean, he literally just fills out a digital form and behind the scenes, it sets up user IDs, establishes permissions, adds into email groups as appropriate, all of this stuff, right? So it went from being a, a task that would involve five, six, seven people from HR and IT all over the place setting this stuff up to one guy who now spends one minute filling out an electronic form and then everything has been automated behind it. So that's one that when it was submitted for, you know, everybody was like, this is a fantastic idea because it just enabled our new hires to go from zero to contributor in a much more effective and short time manner than previously. And so like when the management team got to look at that, I mean, to them, that was a no brainer. I mean, that's one that touches everybody inside the organization. So I thought uh, democratizing the, the kind of feedback around what's most impactful to the organization for me, at least, and I don't know if this is the right answer, but for us, it's the best way to gather the voice of the employees and say, this is the one that impacts us the most. Yeah, I guess it's like um, the, the strength of an idea is actually not just from like the top brass of the company. It's actually Correct. from the people that are doing the work every single exactly. day. So great ideas can come from anywhere. And I think if you as a culture foster and facilitate that feedback to senior management and then you have a consistent way to measure, yep. um, you know, the, the effectiveness or the opportunity cost of implementation of that idea, then that's how you're winning. Yeah, and for us, it's been as much about having systems and and then I would say uh, public recognition. So, you know, people, I think whenever you do something different and new, hey, submit your innovation ideas, you know, people are kind of like, yeah, whatever, right? Um, heard stuff before about ways I can get things. I'm not going to win. They're not going to listen to me. Right. Um, so putting the framework in place, putting the structure in place, you know, encouraging employees and then ultimately recognizing them. I think people, I mean, everybody likes money. Right. So, I mean, the fact that you get like a little free money for submitting things you've done and then more free money to the extent that it's selected as the winner. I um, mean, that's never going to be a detriment. Right. Like people are always going to be like, hey, what the heck, you know, I get some money. Um, but what I've found to be more impactful is a public recognition. So, you know, posting on our internal Namely board, which is kind of like an internal Facebook for the company, um, calling people out in company meetings. I myself, like I just send emails and IMs to the employees who submit ideas and say, like, I was just reviewing the ideas. I think this is a kick-ass idea and thank you for being great. Um, you, you'll be surprised the number of people who are happy to get an IM from a CEO in the middle of the day saying, you know, you know, I've read your idea and I think you're doing awesome work and like keep kicking ass, you know? Um, and, and for me, that's such a small thing to do. Like I get so much personal enjoyment and satisfaction out of reviewing the ideas that people submit. For me to take literally 10 seconds out to send somebody an IM to see a great job, I've seen a bit like I haven't I haven't charted this out but I should um, there's like a statistical correlation between you know people I engage with and their level of ongoing innovation like if you send a note to somebody and said hey read your submission great job chances are they're going to continue innovating they're going to continue submitting ideas because they know that like the top person at the company is actually reading I read all the ideas one by one you know, it's like 20, 30 ideas. Like it's not a gigantic investment of my time. And, you know, sometimes it spurs new ideas in my head. Sometimes I read something and I think, wow, that was amazing. I can't believe that person thought of that. Like I should take some time out of my day and recognize it. And so, you know, I think in, in terms of creating a culture, it's, it's about creating systems and, you know, formalization, contests, dedicated resources, but it's really as much about just recognizing people. I mean, people forget how, how, much people appreciate being told you're doing a great job. Keep up the good work. Like that goes a long way. You know, I, I love what you said there about systems. So here's a funny thing. Cause you, you're the CEO of goal solutions. <laughs> so, so there's a saying I love, which is, um, you know, it doesn't matter what goal you set. Uh, you never rise to the level of your goals. You always fall to the level of your systems. Exactly. I told, I could not agree with you more. <laughs> I could not agree with you more. Like I said, that's why I think it's important to have 
very specific rules, very measurable outcomes, you know, very distinct things. Because if not, I mean, people's efforts and good intentions can only support things for so long. Uh, ultimately, it's about the systems. That's what persists. You know, people come and go, right? Systems are the things that persist. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and, and also, by the way, like, I love what you're doing because also, like, sending that note, it's like you're doing things that don't scale so you can scale. Right, exactly, exactly. But, I mean, I would like to hope, honestly, um, if, I, if I didn't have time in my life to read employees' ideas and suggestions and send notes to the people who I thought were doing great things, I would say I'm doing a poor job of allocating my time. Um, you know, I'm not suggesting that's the most important thing that I can do in life, but in the realm of, I mean, I could work, I don't know, 10, 12 hours a day, five, six, seven days a week, right? Um, I would like to think that taking some small portion of that time out to review the voice of our team members and reward those with just like a pat on the back for the people. I, I'm a, I hope that no matter how big the company gets, that's something that I can always find time to do. And if not, I'll put a system in place to make sure that I have the time to do it. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, there's so much I love about what you're doing. Um, talk to me about your mindset towards implementation of ideas that, that are innovative in nature. So obviously, I mean, if you go back in time, you guys have diversified quite significantly um, and you've been successful at pivoting and figuring out new markets and commercializing these gaps and so on and so forth. And then, of course, you have this innovation lab and this culture of innovation and so on, which is great. What is when it comes to implementation? Right. We, we don't get it right, man. Like a lot of the times it's like it's painful. Right. right, right, right. <clears throat> so I'm, <laughs> I'm a big believer in minimum viable products. Um, so, you know, I, I've built a lot of technology systems, new products over time. And, you know, what I've always found is, you know, to your point, you never get it right. Right. The question is, did you get it 70 percent right or 70 percent wrong? Right. Um, and so, you know, for us, I, 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 what I'd like to hope and the way we try to approach it is implement things in a way that capture the majority of the material state point. So there, there are always if you were to say, OK, what are the for any given new product or new service or new technology we're doing? There's not 500 things that matter equally. Right. There are 10 things that matter. Just they make up 90 percent of the weight. Right. And then you have another 490 things that make up the other 10 percent of the waiting. Right. Um, so when we're implementing, whether it's a new technology or new product, what we're trying to do is I would say twofold. Um, one, get as much of that top 10 pressure points as we can. Correct. And that's based on a lot of testing. I mean, extensive testing, extensive requirements gathering up front. Um, a lot of what we do is, is uh, connecting for like technology deployments, for example. Right. Connecting business subject matter experts with technology people. Um, I have yet to find, and again, we're in the consumer finance space, so it's a little bit different than like a software as a service where maybe engineers can be good product specification people. In my space, that's not what the case. In my space, you generally have business people who understand the specifications and you have technology people who are building to the specifications. If you don't have like very tight interconnectivity between those two functional areas, you can end up with great technology that does not meet the business use case. Um, and then that is a huge problem because the amount of time and energy you invest in things. So, you know, for us, one, it's, it's, it's kind of understand what's the, what are the most important things to get right out of the gate, knowing that you're going to get things wrong. You just want them to be the less impactful things. And so that is a lot of very rigorous testing against the things that you know are going to be most important. Um, and then a lot of what we do, because we do run a services business that, I mean, we have to be up 24 seven. I mean, this is not a, you know, and then we're closed for whatever, right? Like we need to be continually serving our customers. Um, so a lot of the testing we do is don't break the main, like, do not break the main system. Right. Um, so when we're rolling new products out, you know, we started uh, at one point saying, okay, we're going to build literally a separate technology system, kind of a parallel version of our existing technology solution to deal with some of these new asset classes because, you know, there are some similarities there as we can leverage the code base, but um, 
practically speaking, when we start tweaking things, we don't know what the unintended consequences are going to be on the code base. And we are concerned that we may tweak something in a way that impacts the primary core system, um, in a way that maybe we couldn't write enough use cases and test cases and anything to, to actually be able to sufficiently feel like we had uh, we had run everything to ground. And so we ran, I mean, two parallel systems for a period of time before we ultimately merged them into one, once we had a high level of confidence that doing so was not going to jeopardize the main production system. So that's how we approach it. I mean, we, we can't, it, it, it sometimes I would say doesn't allow us to innovate as quickly as maybe I would like to. I, I'm much more of a like throw it against the wall and see if it sticks kind of person, you know? Um, it's, it's kind of by nature, I'm a builder. Like I like to create things I, and I know that what I create is going to invariably be wrong. And so I just want to make sure that I've got the right systems for catching what's wrong and then fixing it. Um, in a business where, I mean, we have some of the largest financial organizations in the world as our clients. That's not really a philosophy that works all that well for product deployment, you know, just throw it against the wall and see what happens. Um, so I'm kind of balancing, you know, my desire to rapidly innovate and prototype and bring new things to market with our need for sustainable, predictable systems. And so, like I say, for us, that's really taken the form of making sure when we do roll something out, we get the top three or four features almost completely correct. And then if we're going to be off, have it some stuff be down among some stuff that maybe doesn't have as high of a weighting from a criticality perspective. Uh, and then just a lot of a lot of uh, recognition that we can't jeopardize our main production systems because given the SLAs and everything we sign up for, it's just not an option. Mm. So here's a funny stat that'll add. <clears throat> so I'm loving this conversation. So there's a, a, a financial services industry uh, trends report that came out um, latter part of last year by Adobe. So you spoke about systems and things like this, right? So, and obviously like you got these massive world's largest financial uh, services companies on your, as customers, right? So right. it's like, sometimes the older they get, they, they dinosaurs and they actually can't climb trees. Right. Uh, and so, and so there's this, the, here's some key findings. 53% of executives uh, are focused on modernizing quotes, core yep. legacy systems as the number one priority right and yeah. then to your point earlier on about enabling frontline staff what have you yeah. and then it's like 57 percent retail banks 56 percent of insurance companies are focused on core systems yeah. compared to with 42 percent wealth management systems so it sounds to me like they've built these rails these things these systems these core legacy systems like and they're like oh my god like the markets are moving how do we remain relevant so 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 there's two things here one I believe you're a startup, absolutely, and I think even as a culture, you'll like you will only you'll always be in meta, like that's your thing. Um, and where I think you guys are hugely valuable, just from what you've been saying, is like it's engaging with these uh, corporates at an innovation level, because they, it's hard for them to innovate because of the inertia. They have shareholders. Right. I, I know you guys have shareholders, but they are like listed companies, what have you. So for them to like throw the baby out with the bathwater, or to, to your to use your <laughs> your phrase, like they're not throwing stuff at the wall to see if it'll stick. Correct. Like, that's your job. Right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. And, and then and then for them to engage with goal solutions to go, okay, we could try and do this ourselves, but we you know, and fund this innovation or in this innovative project, but it's one of another one thousand three hundred and forty two right, right, right. that we have to do this year, right? Because it's part of our strategy and the and there's you know, we've we told investors and, and blah blah blah. So where you guys come in, it's like there's this relationship between like truly innovative startups who are building awesome things in automotive, solar, you know, consumer lending, all this kind of stuff. And then for them to like, and this is the thing, it's you probably heard of this, but like where startups go to corporates to die. So I guess, cause that, you know, right. cause they can't innovate, they just get right. purchased. They're like, cool, I'm taking you off the market. Right. And, it, <laughs> yeah, and it's great because, you know, if you're a, if you're a startup, you get access to like in, in America, like a hundred million customers overnight in yep. theory. But the startup dies because the promise of the hundred right, million right, right. customers doesn't actually manifest in the end. They just buy the technology and then it, you know, it's integrated over here <laughs> and, say, right. and, and say we're innovating. Yeah, <laughs> and we're and we're you know we're lucky in that we are a privately held company owned by a small handful of people who are executives at the business. Um, we. 
you know, we all moved to Southern California. I moved from Minnesota. You know, our chairman moved from New Jersey. Our CFO moved from Montana. Our head of capital market moved from. So we all fled very cold places with lots of snow um, for the warm beaches and the uh, and the climate of Southern California. And you know, what we're you know, I, I talked, I'm, I'm on later today with a, with a venture capital company. I guarantee, you know what they're going to say. They got a checkbook. You know, I'm ready to write your big check. You know, yeah. you just got to do all this stuff, right? Um, and I don't, I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe someday that'll be interesting for our company, but at least if you were to look at, you know, what in our, in our executive management team, I mean, we're all in our kind of like, you know, early to mid 40s. And we love working together. We love living in Southern California and doing something that we really enjoy. I don't, you know, to your point about being sold into a bank, like that's like that's like a visible existence, right? I mean, we came from. I mean, I worked at what is now Synchrony Finance. It was GE Capital back when I worked there, and you know, I had a great time there. But I mean, that was a very different culture than the culture I'm in now. And you know, a lot of our clients are banks, and they're fantastic clients. And and you know, I'm really happy that they're partners, and I'm really happy that they trust us with the great work that we do together. Would we want to be a part of that organization? Would it allow us to have the same culture that we have today and focus on innovation the way that we do and move at the speed we move? I, I don't think so. And at that point, you know, I think what what has made us such a great organization, I mean, you know, to your point, like banks, and trend, they hire us because they want to see their data visualized in a different way. They want to try different things. And they know that like for them to do it inside their organization is going to take who knows how many years to get accomplished? Like if they want to go change the underlying data structure in a data warehouse at a big bank or an insurance company, there are hundreds of stakeholders who are all going to sit there and say, no nice. question, you know, not going to happen. You know, whereas for us, I mean, it's a change we can make, you know, reasonably on the fly. We've created a much more flexible environment. We're leveraging a lot more data bricks these days. Um, you know, and don't get me wrong. I mean, we have, we have to modernize parts of our infrastructure. I mean, we were, in a virtual private cloud for a very long time. We thought the public cloud would be a better fit for us. We moved our whole infrastructure from a virtual private cloud up to the public cloud because from a scalability, redundancy, disaster recovery perspective, it's a better fit. Um, but while we have systems that always need, and I think anybody who tells you they have systems who don't need modernizing is lying. Uh, I mean, technology, the rate it moves and evolves at, everybody's systems need to be modernized. The question is, are you modernizing by like one generation or 20 generations, right? That's the yeah. only question. Um, but I think we're small enough and our technology focus is strong enough that we're able to modernize at a rate that I just think big banks, you know, folks like that are going to have a more difficult time because whereas we're only going maybe one or two or three generations, they're going 20 generations. And, and that's the kind of modernization that it just, you know, especially inside large organizations that are generally pretty risk averse. It's just a hard putt to use a golf analogy. Yeah, well, there's a reason why Microsoft makes like you know a billion dollars profit a week. Correct, correct, correct. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Every, every and week. It, and every hey, week. they built a great technology solution for a good chunk of corporate America. We're big. I mean, we're an Azure. Uh, because we we run a lot of Microsoft applications internally, and they have a great you know they've got a good mouse trap, um, and and thankfully you know with their platform as service offering they're doing on the database side these days that they're starting to make their systems more reflective of the cloud environment and people's you know like their platform as service offering you don't have to handle upgrades and I mean a lot of that stuff is handled behind the scenes so I think they're I think they're starting to adjust but you know to your point they're a legacy business model not a bad model. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's amazing. I've really enjoyed this conversation, Matt, but uh, unfortunately our time has come to an end. We should be doing more of this. I feel like we're only scratching the surface. Um, but um, I have one more question for you and then we'll wrap this up. So um, uh, why do you do what you do? Like what gets you out of bed in the morning? So uh, two things. Um, one, uh, I work with, a, I'm a serial worker. Um, I love learning. Like I, I, I read constantly. I play chess constantly. I mean, I did. I, I, I love to learn and engage in things that activate my mind. And in the business that we're in, uh, we work with some of the smartest people in the world. I mean, I work with some people who are so smart, and I'm. I feel so fortunate to learn from them, and and I'm offered the opportunity to try lots of new things. I mean, I'm a data statistical modeler and data visualization scientist who, you know, over time has migrated into a CEO role, and that's because I've been 
been really, you know, given the opportunity in, internally to learn new different things and try different things. So just kind of general learning in, in, in is one. And then two, um, you know, people like the, you know, the, the people I work with, the people who own the company with me, we've worked together for 15, 16 years. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know if you ever told me, hey, you work at a company that you get to do a bunch of different things and interact with really smart people and work with people who you really have fun working with. Um, you know, I, I would say that doesn't really sound like work, right? And to be clear, it's a job. You know, all jobs have parts of it they don't enjoy. Um, but I think if you're doing things you enjoy with people who you really like working with, um, it makes even the the more difficult parts, um, it always makes them that much more bearable, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so on that bombshell, uh, Matt Myers, thanks for being on the show. It's been a real privilege, man. Cool. Thanks, Matt Brown. I appreciate the time. Anytime. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you all again soon. Thanks, Ciao. everybody. Thank <laughs> you.